Good evening, everyone. I'm Joe Hansen from the Cook Memorial Public Library. Welcome to our One Book, One Community program. We have had a lot of great programs centered around the book, The Bohemians by Jasmine Darsnick. I encourage you to go to our website, onebook.org, using the number one to sign up for them and the author presentation at the end of the month. Tonight, we welcome Lori Ungaretti from the San Francisco Historical Society to talk about the famous Montgomery block, which featured prominently in our One Book, One Community novel. Lori, a, na a native San Franciscan, has written five books and many articles about the city's history, including her latest, Vanished San Francisco, which came out last month. And you can get her books. I noticed it was on Amazon, so if you're interested, it is there. Lori has led historical walking tours of the city and given numerous historical presentations. She drew on personal experience and fascinating research to select more than 100 places and objects that have forever disappeared from the city by the bay. She is a longtime member and volunteer of the San Francisco Historical Society. And when her talk is done, you can submit your questions in the Q&A or the chat or submit them while she's talking, and Lori will be happy to answer them. So welcome, Lori. Thank you. I'll be, I'd be happy to try to answer them. <laughs> um, should we start now? Sure, go or, ahead. Go ahead. Okay. okay, so um, I, I'm pleased to be here and I, I'm i really happy to talk about the Montgomery Block because I've lived here all my life. I was born here and I never heard of it until about a year ago. And, um, and I have just gotten really caught up in research about it, and I hope you will find it interesting. Um, first of all, we have to go back to the early years of San Francisco, since the Montgomery Block first opened in 1853. We have to go actually before then. Um, the, the Bohemians that often lived here uh, or lived there, meant, they call it, called it Monkey Block which um, I don't, so, but I don't have anything against it. I just don't actually call it that. Um, if we go back to, whoops, it's not moving. Okay. Oh, there we go. Um, this is called, this is Yerba Buena Cove, and this is a, a, a well-known in San Francisco drawing of the old view when, when there was a cove at the end of Montgomery Street. What's interesting is there are the street names and the street right here is Montgomery Street. And it came right up to, oops, it came right up to the water. And um, uh, that's why, that's actually why, if, um, and I'll be, saying things in case you come to San Francisco or you know the city, um, that um, First Street is about a mile away from San Francisco Bay because there was, there's was there been so much bay fill in. Uh, and so anyway, I, I wanted to point out where Montgomery was because this um, cove was not completely filled in when they started working on it. Most of you have probably heard that there was a gold rush in California in 1848. And uh, it really changed the city quite a bit. Um, there were, um, this is also, a, it's a view from the land of Yerba Buena Cove. There were hundreds, in 1849, there were hundreds, and uh, really hundreds of abandoned ships because when the word got out about the gold rush, People came here from all over the world, and when they took a ship that landed in the bay, as soon as it landed, people abandoned it, just left to come to the city and then go to the, the uh, gold fields and try to make themselves rich. Um, even the, the crews, the, the boat crews, everybody, everybody just left, and they were all these ships were just abandoned in the bay. Um, it made the gold rush made a big difference to to the city of San Francisco, which at that time was just a little hamlet, a little town that had fewer than a thousand people. And that and but by December 1849, the population of San Francisco was 25,000. 
And by 1852, it was almost 35,000. People built very ramshackle houses out of cheap wood and uh, lived in tents. And it was uh, pretty uh, difficult. It was pretty difficult living because they weren't planning to stay in the city. They were planning to go up to the gold fields and make a lot of money. But the problem with the way that they were building things was these these homes or houses or whatever you want to call them, shacks, um, were quite flammable. And in San Francisco, in um, between 1849 and 1851, there were six major fires. And most of them wiped out the entire part of the developed town. Um, they and and as soon as the fire was over, people would just start building the same type of ramshackle, terrible places that they had been living in. And so then there'd be another fire. And by the second or third fire, they begin, began to learn to build things that were maybe a little more permanent, that were a little bit better. Um, but the... Um, it was it, fire was always a big fear at that time here. The um, I I wanted to show you some of the areas where the land was where the bay was filled in, and that the original coastline is out here, and the dark gray was at one time part of the bay, and that, and then was filled in. And this is Yerba Buena Cove, this, the one I showed you earlier that had all the water, and this is Montgomery Street. And this little red dot is actually about where uh, the Montgomery block was at, the, at that time. And um, a, a senior US Army soldier who had studied engineering, he, um, Henry Halleck, he decided to, that he wanted to build a fireproof building. He hired an architect, G.P. Cummings. The land was partially filled in, but it was still very marshy, very wet. And once anyone went 20 feet down, it was all water. And so they really had to find ways to make, make a strong foundation, but also make it a fireproof building. This is what he wanted to do. Um, first of all, uh, I wanted to mention that, uh, and I hope that we can do this here. Yes. The uh, building was originally called Washington Block. Um, the front of it was on Montgomery, but Washington Street was uh, was along the side, and uh, it was named after George Washington, but people always called it uh, the Montgomery Block. And then they, they put a, a bust of George Washington um, over the main entrance, and people still wouldn't call it Washington Block. So they finally gave up, and it became Montgomery Block. Now it's not working again. Okay. This is the Montgomery block in uh, 1854. It was just about a year old. And it was uh, quite a unique building. Uh, it, first of all, it was built on water. So they had to find a way to build a strong foundation. And what they did, it was uh, built primarily by Chinese laborers. And for the foundation, Redwood logs were floated to San Francisco via the bay, San Francisco Bay, and they were joined together with iron clamps and a uh, and they it was sunk to a depth of 22 feet. It was like a raft of, of logs. What I don't understand is that one thing that I read implied that the um, that there were quite a few rafts on top of each other and they went down 22 feet. But other things I've read just talk about one strong raft. Uh, but that it's kind of uh, an amazing uh, construction. But that was what they were doing. And then the, we, the builders imported 6 million bricks from China. The walls were made three feet wide. The windows had iron shutters that could be closed in a fire. There were four sets of... Uh, four sets of heavy double doors, each filled with asbestos to make it even more fireproof. The frame was ironed, the interior was brick for more fireproofing, and it covered the entire block of um, 
that I showed you on the map or I'm going to show you on the map. Um, when, it was, when it opened in 1853, it was the, um, let me make this lighter. Is that better? When it opened in 1853, it was the largest building in the West, which is really amazing because it's only four stories plus a basement. Uh, but it was an, uh, the largest uh, building. Before the building, there was a meeting of potential investors and the architect Cummings and Halleck described the building of the Washington block and how it was gonna be done. And someone asked, how much would it cost? And, and Cummings said probably $3 million, which was probably like $114 million today. Uh, the, the lore of that meeting the, the, that came down in history was that one man called him a fool and left, and uh, some other people also left. And this became the building became known as um, Halley's Folly, because Folly was very popular then. If something was proposed that was unlikely to work out, it was someone's folly. Uh, so this became Halley's Folly, although once they actually got the, the foundation to work, they didn't call it Halley's Folly anymore. They called it uh, the Floating Fortress because it was floating. Okay. Um, this is the map I was talking about. I, I kind of made this map by hand because I was really, um, I live in San Francisco. You are surrounded by water on, on three out of four sides. And, and so if you want to figure out where something is in the city, you put your, you turn to the, your back to the water and you look at the city and you, you talk about it. Well, you, I couldn't do that here because Montgomery block was built on the water. And, and so instead of uh, north, south, east, west, the directions are different. We're looking east toward the water and behind us is the city. And it was just, it was really hard for me to get, get a handle on that, but that is the way that it worked. And it um, became a, um, a pretty popular place. Let's see. Um, so it was uh, Montgomery on the East, which was the main entrance and then Washington on the North and uh, Merchant Street, which was only about three blocks long on the on the um, south and then Sansom Street which was right over the water or very marshy at that time the building was uh, 122 feet wide by 138 deep and it took up the entire block uh, and so what is there now that's what's there now the Transamerica Pyramid which uh, when, when they were building it in 1970, they had a big sign saying the Transamerica Pyramid, a San Francisco landmark since 1972. And this was in 1970. And I thought how arrogant they must be to think that their building is going to be a landmark, but it kind of is. You kind of know what skyline you're looking at when, when you see that. But you, down, down below, you can kind of see that I mean, it's much, much taller than, than uh, the Montgomery block was, but the Mon Montgom this is Montgomery and this is Washington. And we're coming down from North Beach. I don't know if you know North Beach, but there's a windy street that, um, become, fall, that turns into Montgomery. And so this is where, this is where it was. And um, that's another picture of the Transamerica Pyramid. They don't, it doesn't have the same footprint exactly as the Montgomery block. It's, it's uh, wider. It takes up a little more space at the bottom, but um, it's all, it doesn't, um, it only goes halfway down the block, whereas the Montgomery block went almost all, went all the way to Sansom Street behind. Um, so I'm not looking at my notes. Okay. So uh, back to the Montgomery block. There were, uh, when it opened, it had 150 offices that quickly filled with professional workers, lawyers, businesses, financial institution, publications, and much more. In the basement, gold powder from the gold rush were, would be processed into ingots. The arrow shows the location of the bank exchange, which wasn't a bank exchange. It was, it was a saloon, and it was called the bank exchange. 
Um, it was run by uh, Duncan Nicole, who's on the left here. He was known for inventing what is a famous San Francisco drink, Pisco Punch. Most sources say the recipe is gone forever, although I found a source that's pretty recent that said it was found, the recipe was found 20 years ago. I don't know if that's true, but I know all these people who know how to make Pisco Punch, but it, it, um, it's very sweet. It's made from Pisco brandy made in Peru, pineapple juice, lime juice, sugar, distilled water, and gum Arabic made from the hardened sap of two species of acacia tree. And in what proportions everyone uh, for the last hundred years has been saying, we don't know, we can't, it's lost forever. And now people say they know, and maybe they do, but I don't know if they do. This is a view in 1956, and it shows how Montgomery Street starts going up the hill um, as many of the streets do there. Um, and there are a lot of buildings around it. And it, uh, it doesn't look so big, but it was considered really big at the time. Uh, and if you walk around the block, which I did, I took a field trip down there yesterday or the day before. And, um, and, and I walked all the way around the Transamerica Pyramid block and it's a big block. It was, it was really... Uh, but what's what's interesting also about the Montgomery block is it's amazing number of people who've become famous in San Francisco history who in some way uh, did work or did lived in or did something with the Montgomery block. It's just it's really amazing to me. One of these people is James King of William. He moved to San Francisco in 1848 to uh, make, get rich from the gold rush. Uh, he changed his name to James King. He was James King, and he changed his name to James King of William um, because he said that uh, there are too many James Kings around, and he wanted to differentiate himself from all the others. Um, he was the editor of the San Francisco Evening Bulletin, which was publishing in the Montgomery Block, um, and uh, began, let's see, it began publishing in 1855, so uh, two years after the building opened. He often wrote editorials attacking people that, who, who he felt were immoral or dishonest. And at one point, he went after James Casey, a member of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. On May 14th, 1856, Casey confronted James King of William in front of the Montgomery block and shot him. Um, he was taken to his second floor uh, office in the Montgomery building, and a sponge was put in his wound to try to absorb the, um, the blood, I guess. The attending doctor was Dr. Hugh Tolan, and, but the, and he was very well respected. Tolan Medical Center still exists in San Francisco. The patient died uh, in the Montgomery block six days later. The story is sometimes called the sponge case of 1856 and was depicted in a mural that Bernard Zockheim painted for the University of California, San Francisco as a WPA project in the 1930s. Um, what we have in this image is, um, here's James King of William, there's his wound. Um, and this is Hugh, Dr. Hugh Tolan, who was the attending physician and very well respected. And um, this is Dr. R. Beverly Cole. Cole Street in San Francisco is named after him. Uh, he disagreed with Tolan, uh, but uh, we don't really know who, uh, who had the right answer, except that the uh, person died. Sorry. Okay, here's the Montgomery block in 1862. The, um, the only book that I have found, I'm trying to find it now, is um, that is about the Montgomery block is called Ark of Empire. And it was by Edwal Jones. And he wrote it in 1951. So he knew a lot of people and a lot of things that had happened there. And, it, and as many of you know, we had a, um, a, an earthquake and fire in 1906. And 
many, many, many records were lost. And one of the things was some of the records about the Montgomery, what the Montgomery building, how it was built, how many things were used, any of that, it, all the detail is gone. It's gone forever. Um, but um, let's see what else. The, he said in his book um, about, the, about the Montgomery block, quote, the block was a manifestation of its solidity. It was the assembly place of the city where a magistrate and high place and everyday citizens met on the same footing. In the 1870s, the rents went down. So it, the building was not just filled with professional people and lawyers and, and uh, bars and places like that. Um, creative people known as Bohemians began to move in there. People like a young um, Samuel Clemens, known as Sam then, and uh, later as Mark Twain. He worked for the, at the San Francisco Morning and Evening Call newspaper. In, um, and in 1964, in the Turkish steam baths in the basement, he met a man named Tom Sawyer, also shown here, a fireman. Once Sawyer became famous from Twain's writing, he opened a restaurant in San Francisco and he put a sign in front that read, the original Tom Sawyer's. Um, but in the 1880s, uh, there were still a lot of lawyers there. And in fact, several Supreme Court departments had courtrooms and chambers in the, in the Montgomery block. The back of this photo, which was taken in 1880, says, Joseph P. Hove, the first president of the San Francisco Bar Association, was a tenant for 34 years. Um, and also, oh, I've talked a little bit about the daily evening bulletin and the daily and weekly bulletin um, and the call, different newspapers. The bulletin was published in this corner of the building. So people would know that. In the late 1880s, Adolf Sutro, who is known for uh, many uh, building many places on the west side of San Francisco, um, Sutro Baths and the cliff, some of the cliff houses, he uh, took out a, a suite in the in the building, and he started. He had a massive library that he'd collected from all over the world, and the thousands and thousands of books, and he uh, started moving many of them to the Montgomery Block. He got 24 suites given to him to use for his library. Some parts of the library were two stories high. The lobby, which had been really huge and a meeting place, became much smaller as sections were were, were portioned off for the for the selection of the the collection of the books. Sutro died in 1898, and the library was locked, and so people didn't have access to it. And then. Not long after Sutro died, on April 18th, 1906, San Francisco had the, the earthquake that it's famous for. It was followed by the fire, which probably destroyed far more buildings than the earthquake itself had. Uh, we do know that more than 28,000 houses uh, were burned down and about three-fifths of the growing city was destroyed. Um, this is a view that was taken from, oh, I can't even say where it was taken, but behind the, um, nearby the, I'm sorry, this view was taken from nearby the Montgomery block. And, um, uh, let's see. It, uh, the Montgomery block is right. I mean, you can see it. It's right here. Up here, this is an unusual photograph because it's taken looking toward the city. And so this is the Fairmont Hotel up on Knob Hill, which um, survived the earthquake, but was completely gutted by the fire. And so when it was rebuilt, it was primarily the inside that had to be rebuilt. Um, and and uh, let's see. This build, this picture is also just an unusual view because it's what we see is the backside of the, the Montgomery block right here. And um, 
all of these buildings nearby, these, these, whatever was here was probably destroyed in the earthquake. And probably what was all here was destroyed by the fire. So that the earthquake didn't knock down these buildings, but the fire gutted them. And the um, somebody must have closed those iron shutters because the um, the Montgomery block was almost unscathed. San Francisco is kind of a square. Its its shape is is pretty square. And I show this to kind of show you what happened in whoops what happened in in the earthquake. Um, almost everyone who the city now that is completely this entire a piece of land is entirely built on people live shop, um, go to school all over the city. It, it's completely built. But at this time, this rule kind of shows that the only people that almost all people who lived in San Francisco were on this side of, of this rule. And this white area that is outlined is the area that was completely decimated, completely destroyed. But if not by the earthquake itself, then by the fire. And there was um, nothing surviving. And that's why it's pretty easy to see that three-fifths of the building of the city was gone. Um, now, here's a view of the, the front of the Montgomery block after the earthquake. Apparently, um, because I've read that the buildings all around it were destroyed, uh, it seems likely that what happened here was that these buildings, the earthquake didn't get, but the fire did. And um, and this this place was fine, except if if you remember in um, in the Bohemians that they like to eat at Copas Copas, uh, it was right here, um, and it did burn. It had to close. Uh, and and that's the other thing that I, I think that eventually it came back, um, but it was in other buildings around the city for quite a while. And I have to find out because they have the the Bohemians has uh, uh, Dorothea Lang going there around 1919, 1920. And that could be, but um, uh, that's not what I've found so far. And speaking of Dorothea Lang. This is a picture for around uh, 1920. And um, she did spend time in around the, the Montgomery block, but she never really lived there. Um, her uh, studio was on Sutter Street. And when she married Maynard Dixon on March 21st, 1920, he had a studio, a painting studio in the Montgomery block, but Dorothea did not. She kept her Sutter Street one and then I opened one, another one. And he did have a daughter, Constance, from his first marriage. Um, and there was a difficult relationship between her and Dorothy Lang. But the biography of Lang is not very, um, is not very nice to her. And it kind of says that um, she, uh, uh, did not behave well and she was very impatient with the the stepdaughter and um, um and and arguments would come to blows is what he would say so i don't I, you know i it's it, i i think i like the bohemian's story better um and maynard dixon got married again and his third wife was uh edith hamlin who was a painter also and they both had studios, they had individual studios in the, the um, uh, Montgomery block. This is a, 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 a mural that was in the, in Copas, and uh, we, uh, uh, and it was burned when, when the uh, restaurant was burned. So, but it had been put together by a lot of the Bohemians living there. <clears throat> Okay, I almost missed something. Um, in the Bohemians, Caroline was adopted by Donaldina Cameron of uh, the Mission Home. Caroline was actually a fictional character, um, but the but Cameron and the Mission Home was real. This is the original building 
of uh, at 920 Sacramento Street, about three blocks from the uh, the Montgomery block. It opened in 1874 as the Occidental Board Presbyterian Mission Home. Workers worked with the um, Chinatown police squad to rescue girls from China who were victims of human human trafficking, which they didn't call it that then, but they were also often forced into prostitution at very young ages. The girls, once they were rescued, they stayed at the home and learned to read and sew and recover uh, from these bad experiences. Donald Dina Cameron was a real person too. She came to the home, the mission home in 1895. She was 23 years old and she came to be a teacher However, she was so dedicated to the cause and so good at it that in two years she took over as director and she was the director of the mission home um, until 1934 when she retired. This, um, in 1906, the old building was destroyed, not by the earthquake and not by the fire, but by dynamiting. What uh, parts of the fire department were doing in order to try to stop the fire, they would dynamite large structures that were in the in the way that the fire was moving in the hope that with nothing to burn, the fires would burn out and it didn't work. But uh, there were places around the city that were lost because of the dynamiting. But this was rebuilt. It's a San Francisco landmark. It's still at 920, uh, um, 920 Sacramento Street. And you can see down the street, the uh, Transamerica Pyramid. It's about seven blocks away. And that's how far um, the two were from the, the Montgomery block and the mission home that were. Um, can't really talk about Bohemians in San Francisco without talking about George Sterling. Um, the Montgomery Block became known not only, as I said, for professional offices, but also as a magnet for Bohemians, as they were called. And one thing I was talking about said it was not like the beats of the 1950s or the hippies in the 1960s. Um, but still, it was people who wanted to live differently from the norm and were uh, usually devoted to one of the arts such as writing, acting, painting, sculpting, et cetera. Um, George Sterling was in the Montgomery block in the late 1800s. And he once said, there are two elements at least that are essential to bohemianism. The first is devotion or addiction to one or more of the seven arts. The other is poverty. I like to think my bohemian, think of my Bohemians as young, as radical in their outlook on art and life, as unconventional. He wrote that um, oh, what he decided that was um, that he, he moved into 1907, just after being declared the king of Bohemia, um, he moved to Carmel. And he wrote that he intended to live a Waldenesque ex existence. He urged friends to join him and he built a house on a hill. Designed for entertaining, it had an enormous living room, 30 by 18 feet, and a fireplace made from local stone. A wide porch looked out toward the ocean. And this is where I get a little personal. Um, my, my, when my, after my parents divorced in the 60s, my father married um, Elizabeth Gilbert, who had grown up in Carmel, in the George Sterling house. And um, so for many Christmases and many visits, I would be, I would go down to Carmel and be in this house. And yes, it had an enormous living room that probably was 30 by 18 feet. And it had a fireplace that was made of local Carmel stone. So uh, although my stepmother said that the only thing that was truly original from the George Sterling house was uh, the potting shed um, the rest had all been remodeled and redone, but it's still considered in Carmel a landmark house of George Sterling. Um, and, he, and in the back, there was a, a 
piece of concrete where there had been bonfires. And when the concrete was wet, people wrote their initials. And the only ones that I ever knew that I recognized were GS for George Sterling and JL for Jack London. And now that I've done all this research and heard of other people that he hung out with, I'm wondering if their initials were in the concrete also, but I don't know that. Okay, so we're moving up to 1933. Um, and there was, this is after it was remodeled, after the Montgomery block was remodeled. And the, the main thing that differed was that the stores had these glass windows, which they didn't have before. And, um, and the back of it, Merchant Street, not the back, the right side and the left side, merchant, anyway, they had uh, fire escapes that hadn't been there before. That's the, the one thing that's really obvious from the remodel. During the depression is when the, um, the uh, Bohemians began calling it monkey block and that did stick also. And some people today call it monkey block. Um, it became very popular. Um, but also rents went down. And so uh, the uh, Bohemians could come back. They could afford to live there again. And so many of them returned or new ones came. And this, the way, one way to know that this is the front of Montgomery, of the Montgomery block is it has the arch opening. None of the other uh, sides have that arch. And um, what is on the right here is Merchant Street, which was a kind of an alley, uh, three blocks long, but not big like a street. And it has a, a unique architectural uh, thing on the first floor, feature on the first floor. And here it is uh, a little bit closer. These are sculpt, sculpted heads that actually are quite attractive. Here's a close-up. And this is what was all the way along the Merchant Street side of the building. Let's see. Okay, now we're gonna jump through to um, 1955 because some between about 1933, between the depression and, and the mid fifties, there really weren't very many photos um, taken. And, um, and so then in 1955, they put a plaque on the Montgomery block. Um, and the older man in the picture is O.P. Stidger. Um, he is the person who stopped the people from dynamiting the building in 1906. He, so he's, he was associated with the building for many years. And, um, and he was part of this celebration of putting up the, the plaque noting that it was a California landmark not a city landmark. And um, then more recently, obviously, when they tore down the building, someone saved the plaque and it was moved into the Transamerica Pyramid. And it says this, this San Francisco's first fireproof building erected in 1853 by Henry Wager Halleck was the headquarters for many outstanding lawyers, financiers, writers, actors, and artists. James King of William, editor of the Bulletin, died here after being shot by Casey, May 14, 1856. Escaping destruction in the fire of 1906, the building is preserved in memory of those who lived and worked in it. Um, but three years later, it was announced that the Montgomery block would be torn down for a parking garage. And then people started coming out taking photos. And so here are the first interior photos that I have found, um, and they were taken in the 50s. And um, so in 1958 and 1959, people began photographing the building again. This is Merchant Street, the side with the um, heads. And I, the, the color, you know, the earlier, pictures are not color, but I don't think this was color. I think this must have been painted somewhere between um, 1940 and 1950. Um, but you can still see some of the detail. 
Okay, and then um, this is 1959, and I noticed that there's no parking, there are no parking places. Whereas when it opened in 1853, they were just horses and buggies and there weren't cars and there were empty streets. And even in, 19, in the 1950s, there were some park, uh, not 50s, in the um, 30s, when people started using cars, there were parking spaces. But by the 50s, it was crowded like San Francisco usually is. Um, and this is in 1959, looking up that hill again. And then the, the whole uh, decision of what to do to turn it into a parking lot made me think of the Joni Mitchell song. Um, in 1959, S. E. Honorato bought the property. He planned to build a parking lot. He heard that the city was going to build a, uh, a garage uh, it, um, a few blocks away at Portsmouth Square. And he thought, well, he said, if they're going to build a garage, then I won't tear down the Montgomery block. I'll, I'll repurpose it. I'll find another use for it. The city said that they had no plans to build a garage. So he tore down the Montgomery block um, and, uh, and the city built a garage. <laughs> um, and here is when they were getting ready to tear down the building. And this is the last one I found. It was in the examiner. And um, and I think that um, that was when it was, it was just about, there was nothing left. Um, here's a list. Let's see. Over the Montgomery Block's 107 years, hundreds of people had offices or studios inside, and many more people came to visit the building. Uh, and there is one source that I read that said that after the destruction of the Montgomery Block, artists and others gathered uh, uh, Montgomery Block bricks and mounted them on desk uh, stands with the inscription, rest in pieces. And here are some of the people, um, uh, Gert Gertrude Atherton was a writer, Ambrose Bierce was the, uh, he was a poet and also the, um, the mentor for George Sterling. Samuel Clemens, we know um, as Mark Twain, Ina Coolbrith was a poet, Maynard Dixon painted, and I'm, I'm not gonna go through the whole list, but, um, there, there were just a lot of people who are known here, like Ra Ralph Stackpole, who was an artist in San Francisco. Um, Dr. Sun Yat-sen was the, the first president of the Republic of China, and he was here writing um, some document for the government. The um, we're right near the end. Um, while I was learning about the Montgomery Block, I saw an article, I read an article written um, just in last year. And it, it talked about the oldest block of buildings in San Francisco. And it's the 700 block of Montgomery. It's right next to on the left of the entrance to the Montgomery block. Um, and they still all stand. Th this, these are current photos. They're beautifully maintained, at least on the outside. Um, there's, there's, this is, this is, maybe two thirds of the block. And then the, this is the rest of the block. And to the right is the next block, which had the Montgomery block and now has the pyramid. Um, and it was, uh, it's, it's just a wonderful thing that was kept, I think. And it was made my field trip worthwhile. Um, the reason I'm showing this again, because <laughs> I spent so much time on it, is, is this, this part of um, what used to be Mon uh, became Montgomery Avenue for a while. And then after 1906, it was 
called Columbus Avenue. And it is the, cur the curved road that goes uphill actually to, and leads to North Beach. And a lot of people um, go use that, ro that road all the time, that street all the time. Um, this, this slide, which is the last one, on the left shows the admission day parade passing um, it's already passed or the beginning of it has passed the Montgomery block and it's going up which became Columbus um, and to the right of that is if you were on that road you're you're on Columbus and if you go To the right, right here, you are where the is anyone there? <laughs> Hi, Laura, um, you're, you're breaking up. Yeah. I said that's that I'm I'm done. Yeah, I'm okay. finished. That's the last yeah. slide. All right, you were breaking up a little bit right at the end for some reason. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Very interesting. Um, the first question is, what kind of apartments did the Bohemians have in the monkey block? Were they studio, one bedroom or bigger? Like how many square feet? And any idea how much the rent was? And who owned the building? Um, well, I think Halleck owned the building. He joined, he was in a, used them as their studios. Others might have lived somewhere else. Like Maynard Nick, uh, Dixon, when he married uh, Lang, Dorothea Lang, they actually found a place to live and they lived there, but he did his work in his studio. But a lot of people who, they just didn't have a lot of money. So they uh, they got what they what would be least, less expensive. Although at one point when the building was really full of all the professionals, uh, they they said that it was a thousand a month for a, an upstairs unit, which that that's an incredible amount of money in the 1850s. So I I was kind of shocked to see that. Um, was there any other part of that question that I missed? I think like they were wondering about how many square feet, but I think they're all different sizes. I don't know. They're different sizes, and I, I, obviously, if you had a um, if you if you had a law firm, you know you would have a much bigger thing than just a studio, just a, a one one room 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 place. Yeah. Okay, and then we have and another. Who owned it? I think that I think that Halleck still owned it. So, so O. P. Stidger, the one who saved the saved it from dynamiting and stuff. He he kind of ran it. He was the manager, but I think that Halleck built it and owned it. Okay. And when they tore down the Montgomery building to put up a parking lot, did they use the floating raft that was originally used? Oh, I knew somebody would ask that and I don't know. I have to find that out. I don't, I knew somebody was gonna ask that. Right. Well, now but I don't know the answer to that. More some digging. Okay. Um, I think they probably didn't. I, I, um, I, I, I don't, I suspect they didn't, but I don't want to go any further until I, I know more. Right. Sorry. And somebody's asking about a different building nearby. What kind of things are in like offices, shops, apartments in the Zotrope building? I don't know if oh, that the Zotrope building was known as a George Lucas's building, but I think he sold it to Zotrope, but it had a lot of film oriented things in it um and that's uh yeah the green building on the right um so that it isn't i don't know if it's apartments i've never been in it so i don't i don't really know how much of it is all businesses or if uh, just the businesses are on the bottom i don't know 
Okay. And then somebody asked, since the Montgomery building was known as the monkey block, is there any correlation that Montgomery Wards is nicknamed monkey wards? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I don't know, but uh, yeah, I remember it used to be called Monkey Wart, um, but I don't I don't know if it's related or if people just got lazy twice. <laughs> <laughs> and then somebody said, "Please explain the term block in a building name. Are there others in the city, like they when they called it the Montgomery Block?" Uh, no, we don't. We don't have other places. Um, there was a. Uh, there was actually a building that John Parrott built right around the time that Halleck was building the Montgomery block. And it was um, Par the Parrott building, but sometimes I see it as the Parrott block, but he didn't take up an entire block. I think the Montgomery block got the name block because it actually took up an entire block. And, um, and, and so it was just descriptive. Uh-huh. And then uh, is the floating raft construction part of the reason the Montgomery block wasn't damaged during the earthquake? Um, it is believed that it 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 just kind of went with the flow. <laughs> yeah. You know, the shaking happened and it just kind of went with it, but it, there was not earthquake damage to it. And that would be the only reason I can think of is that there was something really strong and good about that. And And I can remember that even as late as the 70s, 1970s and 80s, they talked about um, some of the condos being built on floating foundations so that they would move with earthquakes but not be damaged by them. I don't really know how, how much that caught on, but people were talking about that. Okay. Um, I think I got- Ooh, there are 20 people in chat now. <laughs> yeah, there's- Anyone else have any other questions? Um, I think we've answered all of them. You're getting a lot of really nice comments about an interesting presentation. And someone said, you weren't breaking up. You were for me for a little bit there. I don't know, you know, the internet people, it's, it's it can be a real pain. It can be a blessing and a pain at the same time. Um, let's see, anything else? I think we asked, we got them all. Um, let's see. And people have asked about, are we gonna record this? We will. And uh, I'm gonna to have to send the recording to our communications person who will try to get it up on her YouTube channel. It'll be up there for a little while, you know, until the end of February when um, the program is over. So if you know people who wanted to see it tonight or couldn't make it, just let them know that there will be a recording. And um, other than that, I think we'll wrap it up. Did you have anything else to say? And people, Laurie, people are saying the photos are terrific and they really enjoyed that. Thank you. Good. Uh, um, the only thing I have to say is that uh, this is not all you'll hear from me with the Montgomery block because I hope to write something at some point, so. Excellent, well, I'm glad that I hope that this prompted you, you know, our little program here tonight you know, inspired you to do more. And, yeah. and let's see, here's q and Well, these are all the same. Um, so, and again, everyone, make sure you register for the author event. You can see it either in person at Stevenson High School, or you can Zoom it too. So make sure you sign up for that and, and check out our other programs that are coming up and our book discussions. So uh, I appreciate y'all coming tonight. And thank you so much, Laurie. It's really been fun having this talk. Fun for me too. Thank you. And thank you for your questions. And yeah, I'm sorry that I can't answer some of them. I'm still learning. Yeah. It's, you know, that's the thing with history. I mean, when it's not written about much, you have to dig a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming and have a really pleasant evening. Bye okay. everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.